A lot of people have wanted me to make instructional videos on karate, or more properly, Tung Soo Do. And I will be doing that. I have to talk to somebody about video uh, video recording me uh, so that the tapes, well not the tapes, so that the videos actually look halfway decent. Um, it's difficult to make martial arts videos, particularly instructional videos, because you have to have tracking. Uh, in the sense that you have to follow the technique, you have to actually be able to see the whole person. It's not something that you can just like set a phone down and do. Uh, maybe some of it you can, like maybe breaking or something like that. I could probably set a camera down and get that on camera, um, but it wouldn't look as good as it would if somebody else was recording it. But I'm gonna talk first, I'm gonna start talking about the history of the martial art I take. Now, part of the history of Tung Soo Do I would consider semi-mythical. Uh, not in the sense that it it's based on things that didn't happen, but it's based on um, cultural traditions that may not really be there, if you know what I mean. They may not be in Tung Soo Do. Tung Soo Do is very much essentially Shotokan Karate. That's essentially what Tung Soo Do is. Now, the kicks and stuff have been Koreanized, meaning uh, in Tung Soo Do, you can kick at any level. A lot of the joint locks, throws, uh, stuff that people might consider not to be in karate, actually are in karate. Um, and then there's other stuff in American Tung Soo Do or American karate uh, that actually comes from the military. Because a lot of the people that learned Tung Soo Do and learned Shotokan and learned these martial arts, uh, basically Shotokan, uh, Tung Soo Do, and Judo primarily, uh, that brought it back to the States, uh, learned these things, uh, mixed them together with what they learned in the military as hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, and then taught that to their students. Uh, so American karate is different than Asian karate. Uh, big differences are in the way we train, but also the philosophies. But So let's talk about the origins, the semi-mythical origin, I would call it, of Tung Soo Do. So it all starts with the Hwarang Knights. The Hwarang, also known as the Flowering Knights, was an elite organization of young males from high social ranking families. These men gathered to study art, philosophy, and religion. They also trained in martial arts and traveled together. Hwarang belonged to the Kingdom of Silla, uh, one of the three kingdoms of the peninsula of Korea. The origin of Hwarang can be traced back to the reign of King Ji Hyung uh, from 540 to 576, where they started to take part in the Silla's, uh, well, in Silla's army, uh, training to become warriors and serve their kingdom with honor and integrity. Uh, there are mentions in poems. That's also what well, you have to understand. There's a big degree of militarization in Tung Soo Do that you will not see in Okinawan karate, but you may see in Okinawan karate taught in mainland Japan. A lot of order, a lot of, um, a lot of structure is in Tung Soo Do that you don't necessarily see in Okinawan karate. It's very militaristic, very regimented. Uh, it's, it's taught differently than Okinawan karate. Uh, there are mentions in poems and songs about how handsome they were and how good they smelled. For this reason, they received the name of the Flowering Knights. They were considered to be the most refined, elegant, and educated men of their time, selected carefully from the aristocracy, and known for their code of conduct and highest standards. We still have this in the five codes and seven tenets of Tung Soo Do. Um, the ones who were chosen by Silla Kingdom became warriors and knights of the Silla Dynasty. They were introduced to the teachings uh, from a young age where they learned about martial arts, which taught them self-defense. They also learned about morality and spirituality from Buddhism and, well, and Confucianism. Actually, Confucianism 
is more so uh, prevalent in the teachings of Hor of the Horang, but Buddhism was taught to give a peaceful mind. So the morality comes more from Confucianism, but the peaceful mind, uh, similar to the Japanese samurai, where the the meditative practices of Buddhism allows you to train your mind to uh, kill without remorse, so to say, uh, which gave them self-control. Historians believe that the Horang played a great role in the unification of the three kingdoms of Korea, Silla, Baik, Baikje, and Goguryeo, which is actually where Korea gets its name. Uh, in the Korean peninsula, one specific monk, Wan Guang, is known for the creation of the Horang Code Texts containing the rules of ethics behavior, these writings are called the Code of Honor or Five Commandments of Secular Life, which are uh, loyalty to country. Now, these are the five codes of Tung Sudo. In Tung Sudo, it's loyalty to country, obedience to parents, honor, friendship, never retreat in battle, and in fighting, choose with sense and honor, is how we translate it now. Uh, some people translate it as loyalty to country, obedience to parents, honor, friendship, no retreat in battle, and in, and, and killing shoes with sense and honor. This is the original. Of course, this is probably just translated differently by different people, but it's loyalty to country, devotion to one's parents, trust among friends, never retreat in battle, and kill only with forethought. Uh, forethought. In 2016, KBS2 launched the drama series called Huarang, the Poet Warrior Youth, a fiction production that relates to the history of the Silla Kingdom and the creation of, Hor of Horang, with the aim of fighting for the unification of the Three Kingdoms of Korea. There are mentions about Horang up until the beginning of the 10th century, which suggests that they existed until the end of the Kingdom of Goryeo. Uh, which is uh, 918 to 1392 that unified and ruled the peninsula of Korea until the beginning of the Joseon dynasty in 1392. The history of Horang was not widely known until the National Liberation Day of Korea in 1945. From then on, Horang became an elevated symbol. See, the thing is, after Japan was kicked out of Korea, the Koreans uh, needed something that was Korean to gain national pride, and that's why this idea of elevating the Horang, and I'll get into that when I talk about Taekwondo versus Tung Soo Do, and why Taekwondo, it's similar to karate, and I'll explain what I mean by that in, in the sense, similar in karate in the nationalistic sense, and I, you know what, I'll explain it now. Both karate, like karate, and and Tung Su Do mean the way of the Chinese hand or China way hand. So Karate means Kara, Chinese, Te, hand, Do, way of. So it would translate into the way of the Chinese hand. Later to make it more nationalistic, so it would be accepted by the Japanese uh, as opposed to just the Okinawans. There's another, another meaning for the word Kara, it's pronounced the same way, but it has a different symbol. And what that means, if you change the, the letter, the symbol, instead of meaning China, it means uh, empty. So they changed it to uh, kara, empty, te, hand, do, way of. In tang, tang su do, so tang means tang dynasty or China, Su or so means hand and do means way of. So that means way of the China hand or way of the Chinese hand or way of the Tang hand or the Tang hand. So the, the idea of Taekwondo is Taekwondo is sounds similar to Taekian. Taekian, although it's different, Taekian is a traditional Korean martial art that goes back I think well over a thousand years, uh, and that's where you get Taekwondo, which sounds similar to Taekiondo, okay? So that's why that was done, similar to how the Okinawans, or the to make it more acceptable to the Japanese, changed Karate from way of the China hand to way of the empty hand. So 
the whole rang became an elevator okay so i already read that that's that okay and that's i'm gonna move on now this is just another view of sort of the same stuff from someone else so the Horang were an extraordinary group of ancient knights from Silla, uh, one of the three kingdoms in the region of the Korean Peninsula. They were an elite sect. They were sort of like the special forces of their time. They were an elite sect, uh, sect chosen from high society families while still in their childhood to train as elite warriors educated to the highest standards with a code of conduct that called for them to maintain honor in all encounters. This band of warriors was not all bravado and machismo. Uh, these boys were well-bred, well-groomed, and if you believe how they are portrayed in recent South Korean drama romance series, seem to very much, uh, very much be in tune with their feminine side. <laughs> oh, God. But what, uh, what truth do we know of the reputedly both noble and beautiful flowering knights? The Horang, uh, which has been translated variously as flowering youth, flowering boys, flowering knights, usually it's translated to the um, flowering manhood or flowering youth is how it's usually translated. There, originally there was, um, uh, what do you call it, female, uh, a female organization of shamanesses uh, that predated the Horang. I might get into that in another video, going over the origin. These are the semi-mythical origins of Tung Sudo. Is, no, I shouldn't say semi-mythical. They're the legendary origins of Tung Sudo. Uh, bu 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 it was an organization of elite young males that existed in Silla, an ancient kingdom that ruled over the, so the southern and central parts of the Korean Peninsula from the 1st century BC to the 10th century AD. Although the Horang is often perceived as being solely a military organization some have argued that it's mem that members of this society also served a religious and educational function in Silla that's most likely true due to the culture the word horang is a combination of two words hua which means flower and rang which is a general term for man not necessarily meaning specifically a boy or a youth it has been stated that there is a lack of primary sources that describe the Horang, meaning there's not a lot really known. Nevertheless, there is secondary literature that draws heavily from primary sources that have since been lost to time. These works deal mainly with the organization of the Horang or the religious associations that they had. As a result, one of the hotly debated topics among scholars who study the Horang is the true function of this organization. While some are of the opinion that the Horang served purely a purely military role in the society of Silla. Others argue that it had a primarily religious function instead. Okay. A female prequel. Oh, it gets into it right here. A female prequel to the Horang. According to the available, you have to remember, Korea used to be matriarchal. A lot of a lot of cultures used to be matriarchal um, prior to being patriarchal. According to available sources, the Horang was founded during the sixth century BC. Prior to its foundation, there was another institution known as the Wanhua, meaning original flowers. That was similar to the Horang. The Wanhua consisted of females and was divided into two bands, which were led by women, uh, Namo and Junjung. Uh, these two leaders uh, soon grew jealous of each other. Yeah, women tend to do that. Uh, I hear that's what did what did in the Church of Satan was uh, the uh, Carla Levey and the uh, the uh, what's her face uh, Blanche Barton bickering between one another. I don't know how true that is. The later was executed for her crime, and the Wanhua was disbanded. The Horang Boys Academy, later on, the King of Silla wanted to strengthen his country and hence decided to form another organization like the Wanhua. This time, however, members of this institution were chosen from boys. Didn't like the bickering. Did not like the bickering. Chose from boys of aristocratic birth uh, and who were of good morals. Thus, the Horang came into existence. It has been suggested that the Horang was established so that the most talented youths of the aristocracy could be selected and trained up 
in order to serve in the state apparatus later on, it has been pointed out that many well-known generals and political figures had been Hurang during the early part of their uh, lives. I wonder if that's similar to like, if they have Hurang conspiracy theories in Korea, like in the West we have, um, you know, what is it, uh, the Freemason uh, conspiracies. So many presidents were Freemasons, yada, 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 yada. <laughs> As for the reputation they had for being beautiful, they were reported to take great care of their appearance in what might be termed in modernity as a metrosexual fashion. Wearing both cosmetics and fine clothes, they were also said to burn incense, thus creating a fine fragrance as they traveled their adventurous path. The sources state that the Horang often met in places of great natural beauty, especially the sacred mountains and rivers, to sing and dance. Another important activity of the Horang was religious studies. This was a combination of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, as well as uh, some elements of shamanism that has been practiced in the Korean Peninsula long before the coming of the other three. Uh, moreover, the Horang were required to train in the art of war, thus preparing them to serve as warriors when it was needed. The renowned Silla general Kim Yushin, for instance, had been a Horang. His military campaigns aided Silla in its endeavor to unify Korea and is best known for successfully leading the campaign against the Baekji, Baekji, also spelled Baekji, a rival kingdom. The Horang Code, we already been through this, uh, so this, the, this has it as to serve the king with loyalty, to serve one's parents with loyalty, to always show loyalty to one's friends, to never retreat in battle, to never kill unnecessarily. The Hurang were would eventually diminish in importance and disappear similar to the samurai in Japanese culture and disappear almost completely from history. Nevertheless, the rise of Korean nationalism, remember I stated that, the rise of Korean nationalism, as well as the discovery of a manuscript entitled The Chronicles of the Hurang during the 1980s sparked a renewed interest in the Hurang. The popularity of the Hurang is visible in Korean society today. Uh, the Taekwondo Kwondo pattern called Horang, for instance, was named in honor of the Horang, uh, whilst a Korean television series called Horang, the Poet Warrior Youth, was aired between 2016 and 2017. As I had noted, Confucianism was very important to the Horang Knights and to Korea of that era. Uh, so what is Confucianism? Well, Confucianism obviously is the philosophy of Confucius, but who was Confucius? Uh, was it a philosophy? Was it a religion? Is it both? It's a little bit of both, actually. Confucianism is one of the most influential religious philosophies in the history of China, and it has existed for over 2,500 years. It is concerned with inner virtue, morality, and respect for the community and its, va and its values. Uh, Confucian philosopher uh, Mencius Confucianism is an ancient Chinese belief system which focuses on the importance of personal ethics and morality whether it is only or whether it is only or a, philo a philosophy or a or also a religion is hot, is debated Confucianism is a philosophy and belief system from ancient China, which laid the foundation for much of Chinese culture. Confucius was a philosopher and teacher who lived from 551 to 479 BCE. His thoughts on ethics, good behavior, and moral character were written down by his disciples in several books, the most important being the Lun Yu. Confucianism believes the, in ancestor worship and human-centered virtues uh, for living a peaceful life, the golden rule of Confucianism, do not do unto others what you would not want others to do unto you. There is a debate over if Confucianism is a religion. Confucianism is best understood as an ethical code uh, to life and living with strong character, yet Confucianism also began as a revival of earlier religious tradition. There are no Confucian gods, and Confucius himself is worshipped as a spirit rather than a god. However, there are temples to, of Confucianism, which are places where important community and civic rituals happen. This debate remains 
remains unresolved, and many people refer to Confucianism as both a religion and a philosophy. The main idea, that's almost, I would say that's similar to Buddhism. Is Buddhism a religion, or is it a philosophy, or is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. Uh, and, and it depends on the person practicing it. Okay, the main idea of Confucianism is the importance of having good moral character, which can then affect the world around that person through the idea of cosmic harmony. If the emperor has moral perfection, his rule will be peaceful and benevolent. Natural disasters and conflict are the result of straying from the ancient teachings. This moral character is achieved through the virtue of Ren, or humanity, which leads to more virtuous behaviors such as respect, altruism, and humility. As humility. Confucius believed in the importance of education in order to create this virtuous character. He thought that people are essentially good, yet may have strayed from the appropriate forms of conduct. Rituals in Confucianism were designed to bring about this respectful attitude and create a sense of community within a group. The idea of fil uh, filial piety or devotion to family or filial piety or devotion to family is key to Confucius thought. This devotion can take the form of ancestor worship, submission to parental authority, or the use of family, family metaphors such as son of heaven to describe the emperor and his government. The family was the most important group for Confucian ethics, and devotion to the family could only strengthen the society surrounding it. Remember how I explained and a number of other videos that the family, the concept of um, the family unit as the basic building block besides the individual, it's the individual and the family unit are the building blocks of, um, of a society uh, and that the, the concept of the fasci. Uh, so it's, it's very similar regardless. Uh, these are human values that transcend culture and uh, you know, they really do. While Confucius uh, gave his name to Confucianism, he was not the first person to discuss many of the important concepts in Confucianism. Rather, he can be understood as someone concerned with the preservation of traditional Chinese knowledge. From earlier thinkers after Confucius' death, several of his disciples compiled his wisdom and carried on his work. The most famous of these disciples was Mencius, and, uh, and I believe that's Shunzi, uh, both of whom developed Confucian thought further. Confucianism remains one of the most influential philosophies in China during the Han Dynasty. Emperor Wu Di reigned from 141 to 87 BCE, made Confucianism the official state ideology. During this time, Confucius schools were established to teach Confucian ethics. Confucianism existed alongside Buddhism and Taoism for several centuries as one of the most important Chinese religions in the Song Dynasty from 960 to 1279. Uh, the influence from Buddhism and Taoism uh, brought about Neo-Confucianism, which combined ideas from all three religions. However, in the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1912 Common Era, many scholars looked for a return to the older ideas of Confucianism, prompting a Confucian revival. So, Korean Buddhism was another thing that influenced the Horang knighthood. You might ask, why is it important that I call it Korean Buddhism? Why are we looking at Korean Buddhism? Well, you see, Buddhism, like Christianity, differs very greatly based on the culture in which it comes up in. Uh, you will notice, like for example, Catholicism is very different from Ireland to Mexico, or English Catholicism compared to, say, Polish Catholicism. They're, they differ greatly. But Korean Buddhism is distinguished from other forms of Buddhism by its attempt to resolve what its early practitioners saw as inconsistencies within the Mahayana Buddhist traditions that they uh, received from the foreign countries. To address this, they developed a new holistic approach to Buddhism that became a distinct form of uh, an approach characteristic of virtually all major Korean thinkers, resulting in the variation called uh, Tong Bulgyo, uh, in, uh, Interpenetrated Buddhism, a form that sought to harmonize previously arising disputes among scholars, a principle called Hua Jiang. Okay. 
So, centuries after Buddhism originated in Nepal, the Mahayana tradition arrived in China through the Silk Road in the first century CE via Tibet. It then entered the, King the Korean Peninsula in the third century during the Three Kingdoms period from where it was transmitted to Japan. In Korea, it was adopted as a state religion of three constitute poly uh, po uh, polities of the Three Kingdoms period, first by the uh, Goguryeo, also known as Goryeo, in 372 CE by the Silla or Gaya, uh, in 528 CE and by Be Bikji in 520, uh, 552 CE. Uh, as it now stands, the Kore stands, Korean Buddhism consists mostly of the Sun lineage, primarily represented by the uh, Jugia and Taegyo orders of the Korean Sun. I'm probably mispronouncing these just so everybody knows. Korean is not my strong point, never has been, never will be. Unless I choose to learn it, maybe has a strong relationship with other Mahayana, which means greater, greater vehicle form, the greater vehicle school of Buddhism. Uh, so the Mahayana traditions that bear the imprint of the Cha'an teachings, uh, as well as the closely related Zen. So Cha'an and Zen Buddhism are technically the same thing, but you will notice a very big difference in how Japanese Zen Buddhism is practiced from Chinese Cha'an Buddhism. Other sects such as the modern revival of the Chunte lineage and the Jingak order, a modern esoteric sect, and the newly formed Wan have also attracted sizable followings. Korean Buddhism has contributed much to East Asian Buddhism, especially to early Chinese, Japanese, and Tibetan schools of Buddhist thought. Historic over overview. When Buddhism was originally introduced to Korea from former Qin, about 800 years after the death of the historical Buddha, shamanism was the indigenous religion of the Samguk Yusya and Samguk Sagi record. The following three monks were who were found who were among the first to bring Buddhist teaching or Dharma to Korea in the fourth century during the Three Kingdoms period. Uh, Malanantya, an Indian Buddhist monk who came from a uh, Serindian uh, area of southern China's eastern Jin, di Jin dynasty uh, and brought Buddhism to the King uh, Chim Chimnyo and Bikji in, uh, in the southern Korean peninsula, blah, 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 monk of northern Chinese state, former Quin, brought Buddhism to uh, Goguryeo uh, in northern Korea in 372 CE, and Otto, a monk who brought Buddhism to Silla in Central Korea. As Buddhism was not, uh, was not seen to conflict with the rites of nature worship, it was allowed by adherents of shamanism to be blended, similar to how in Japan it was blended with, uh, with what do you call it, uh, Shintoism, and how in China it was blended with Taoism. Uh, these are both Shintoism and Taoism are also similar to shamanism, their nature worship. Uh, to be blended into their religion, thus the mountains that were believed by shamanists to be the residence of spirits in pre-Buddhist times later became the sites of Buddhist temples. Uh, you'll notice a very similar similarity to how Christianity spread throughout Europe and the, uh, the New World. Though in, it initially enjoyed wide acceptance, even being supported as the state ideology during the Goryeo, period, Buddhism in Korea suffered extreme repression during the Joseon era, uh, which lasted over 500 years. During this period, Neo-Confucianism uh, overcame the prior dominance of Buddhism. Only after Buddhist monks helped repel the Japanese invasions of Korea in 1592 and 1598 did the persecution of Buddhists stop. Buddhism in Korea remained subdued until the end of the Joseon period when its position was strengthened somewhat by the colonial period, which lasted from 1910 to 1945. However, these Buddhist monks did not only put an end to the Japanese rule in 1945, but also asserted their specific and separate religious identity by reforming their traditions and practices. They laid the foundations, again, this is Korean nationalism. You'll notice 
They reformed the traditions and practices. They laid the foundation for many Buddhist societies. The younger generation of monks came up with the ideology of uh, Mingong uh, Pol, uh, Polyo, or Buddhism for the people. The importance of this ide ideology is that it was coined by the monks who focused on common men's daily issues after World War II. The Sion, the Sion school of Korean Buddhism once again gained acceptance. Except of, ex, uh, extent of syncretic impact of Buddhism. A 2005 government survey indicated that about a quarter of South Koreans identified as Buddhist. However, the actual number of Buddhists in South Korea is ambiguous as there is no exact exclusion criterion by which Buddhists can be identified. Unlike the Christian population, with Buddhism's incorporation into traditional Korean culture, it is now considered a philosophy and cultural background rather than a formal religion. As a result, many people outside of the practicing population are deeply influenced by these traditions. Thus, when countering secular believers or those influenced by the faith, while not following other religions, the number of Buddhists in Korea is considered to be much larger. Similarly, in officially atheist North Korea, while Buddhists officially account for 4.5% of the population, a much larger number, over 70% of the population, are influenced by Buddhist philosophies. Uh, Buddhism in the Three Kingdoms. When Buddhism was introduced to Korea in the 4th century CE, the Korean peninsula was politically subdivided into three kingdoms. We've been through this before. Yeah, da, 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 da. We don't need to go through that again. Buddhism in the North and South states. Uh, that's not important either. So I'm going to move on. Korean shamanism or Korean folk religion is an animistic ethnic religion of Korea which dates back to prehistory and consists of the worship of gods and ancestors as well as nature spirits. Okay, the general word for shaman in Korea is mu. Uh, in contemporary terminology, they are called mudang if female or bak, uh, baksu if male. Although other terms are used locally, the Korean word mu is synonymous with the Chinese word wu, which defines both male and female shamans. The role of the mudang is to act as intermediary between the spirits or gods and humanity in order to solve hitches in the development of life, though the practice of gut rituals uh, Central to Korean shamanism is the belief that many different gods or supernatural beings and ancestor worship. The Mu are described as chosen persons. The, the, the cool thing about shamanism is wherever there is a mongoloid people, whether it's Siberia or Mongolia or China or Tibet or all the way down to Chile, shamanism is pretty much the same thing. It's pretty neat, actually. Um, that it seems to be an, an intricate part of these people's makeup. This, this, uh, this ideology, this religious outlook seems to be very intertwined with the Mongolian people, the Mongoloid people. So Korean shamanism has influenced some Korean uh, new religions such as Cheondoism and Jungsianism, and some Christian churches in Korea make use of practices rooted in shamanism. The mythology of Korean shamanism is orally recited during gut rituals. I don't know what they are. I probably should look that up, but it's not important because I just want to get a, ver an idea of what's going on for people so they understand this is one of the many things that helped in the formation of the Horang, and the Horang are the legendary progenitors of Tung Soo Do. Terminologies, names of the religion. Besides Muism, other terms used to define Korean shamanism include uh, Pung Wol Do, Way of Brightness, used by the Confucian scholar Cho Chiwan uh, between 9th and 10th century, and Goshingo, Way of the Ancestral Gods, used in the context of the new religious movement of Daejongism, which was founded in Seoul in 1909 by Nachyo, and shamanic associations in modern South Korea use terms Shindo or Moshindo, uh, shamanic way of the spirits, to define their congregations or membership, and Musogin uh, or Musojin, 
uh, people who do shamanism to define the shamans. Names of the shamans. The Korean word mu defines shamans of either sex. Uh, already in records from the Joseon dynasty, mudang, uh, a prevalent usage mudang is likely had to have originated from the Siberian term for female shamans, which is utagan or utakan. Uh, mudang, now notice, for Siberian shamans. So there's that connection. Shaman, shamanism is shamanism. It's pretty, pretty cool shit that it's actually that consistent. It's very, very mild surface differences based on culture. And obviously, the culture is a little different from, from area to area, but it's remarkable how much these people have retained their culture, uh, their, their biological culture. To me, shamanism does show the biological roots of culture, very much so. It's the, the, the expression of shamanism across all of the Mongolian people. It's very, whether it's in the Amazon rainforest or in Siberia, it's, it's remarkable how consistent the beliefs are. Mudang is used mostly but not exclusively for female shamans. Male shamans are called by a variety of names including Sana Mudang, literally male Mudang. In Seoul area, in the Seoul area or Baksu Mudang, also shortened to Baksu, doctor healer, or doctor or healer, I should say. In Pyongyang area, according to some scholars, Baksu is an ancient authentic designation of male shamans and uh, locu locutions like Sana Mudang and Baksu Mudang are recent coinages due to the prevalence of female shamans in recent centuries. Baksu may be a Korean adaption of the terms lo loaned from Siberian languages such as Baksi, Balsi, and Basi. The theory of an indigenous Siberian or origin of Korean shamanic terminology is more reasonable than theories which explain such terminology as originating in Chinese, given that Chinese culture influenced Korea. So the idea that Siberian shamanism is the origin of, China, of uh, Korean shamanism as opposed to these originating in China uh, is probably most likely. Uh, you have to remember this, this all comes from Siberia, Mongolia area. Uh, types and roles of shamans. Very interesting, the Chukchi people. People should look up the Chukchi people. The Chukchi people are a very interesting group of people that are the, seem to be the root of Asians and Eurasians and Europeans. Very interesting. Uh, there are four basic categories of Korean shamans referred to by the dominant local name for shamans. The Mudang type shamans are traditionally found in northern Korea, the provinces of Hamgyong, Pyongyang, uh, Hwang, 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 Hwang He, I probably messed that up, and northern Gyeonggi, including the capital of Seoul. Uh, they are initiated into shamanism by uh, Sinbyong, uh, an illness caused by a god entering their bodies and is cured only through initiation. They share their body with the soul of a specific deity referred to as Momju, lord of the body. During shamanic rituals, they undergo transpossession and speak with the voice of the god being invoked. The Dangol type shamans are priests and not shamans in the strict sense. They are found in the southern and eastern provinces of Gangwon, Gyeongsong, uh, I, I'm not even gonna continue to try and pronounce Korean localities. Okay, the Dangol are uh, hereditary rather than being initiated by a supernatural experience. They have no supernatural powers, are not associated with their own gods, and do not undergo transpossession. They merely worship a number of gods with a fixed set of rituals. It's more similar to, say, how the Aztec religion and such arose from shamanism, but, it, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's more how there is a, an organ, a higher organization of the shamanic religion into a more organized religion. Okay, self-loss and divine light. 
People who become shamans are believed to be chosen by the gods through a spiritual experience, a form of ecstasy which entails the possession from a god and a self-loss, meaning the loss of the ego. This state is said to manifest in symptoms of physical pain and psychosis. Believers assert, now this is similar to the vision quest of the Native Americans. Believers assert that the physical and mental symptoms are not subject to medical treatment, meaning medical treatment cannot fix them, but are healed only when the possessed accepts a full communion with the spirit, meaning they accept the full symbiosis with the spirit. The illness is characterized by a loss of appetite, insomnia, visual and auditory hallucinations. The possession, the possession then undergoes the narim gut, a ritual which serves both to heal the sickness. This is very similar to a lot of Native American beliefs sickness to formerly establish the person as a shaman. Korean shamans also experience uh, uh, Shin Mayung, uh, divine light, which is the channeling of a god during, the, during which the shaman speaks prophetically. Okay, Korean shamanism, origins and myths. Shamanism can be tracked back to 1000 BC. The religion has been part of the culture of the Korean peninsula. Since then, historically, Korean shamanism was an orally transmitted low-ranking uh, um, transmitted tradition that was mastered mainly by illiterate low-ranking women, similar to witchcraft in Europe uh, within the Neo-Confucian hierarchy. However, several records and texts have documented the, cor the origin of Korean shamanism. One of these texts is Wei Shi, uh, which traces shamanism to the third century. Evidently, the history of Korean shamanism remains a mystery. However, foreign religions, including Chinese, China, uh, I'm sorry, Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism have influenced the development of Korean shamanism. The development, and this is similar to Bon in, uh, in Mongolia and Tibet, the development of Korean shamanism, the development of Korean shamanism can be categorized in different groups. We're not going to go through that and get a general idea. Now, what's interesting, and I'm going to go over this uh, in an upcoming video, maybe at, at the end of this video, but Taoism plays an important role in Taoism or Taoism, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It just means the way. Uh, it's very important in Korean culture. In fact, the South Korean flag has I Ching uh, tree grims on it, and I'm going to explain what they are in a little bit. Uh, one of Korea's well-known founding myths in which a tiger and bear seek to become human during an encounter with Huang Nyung may be viewed as a Taoist da parable. The exact origin, despite various theories by historians, is in question because the royal records maintained by the Korean kingdoms were destroyed during the da background. Broadly speaking, Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism infused native totemism and shamanism uh, from the earliest centuries of the Common Era, but Buddhism dominated official thought during Silla and Goryeo dynasties, replaced by Confucianism during the Joseon dynasty. Uh, very little writing on Taoism survived prior to the 20th century until recently Taoism in Korea received little attention from scholars, usually only described as a romantic influence or literary theme with in other contexts. Taoism's effects have been limited because of the lack of institutional or political base rejected by Confucian and Buddhist elites. Some modern scholars, however, are calling for a more critical reading of Confucianized histories, study of alternative sources, and a broader definition of Taoism to find more extensive presence of Korean Taoist ritual practices and positive valuations. Okay, so during the... And why am I always saying... Why do I always have, like, Taoism in Korea? Korean Buddhism. Koreans have a tendency to nationalize things like the Japanese. Taoism first arrived in Korea in 624 uh, uh, CE, I believe, uh, by Emperor Gaozu, the founder of China's uh, Tang Dynasty, sent a Taoist preacher and literature, uh, Lao Zi, and Zong, uh, Zongzi to the Guru uh, kingdom there. Uh, these were eagerly welcomed by the Guru's 
king and his minister, Yun Gyeosyeon, whatever. Buddhist temples were eventually transformed to Taoist temples. However, the first enthusiasm lasted for only 30 years. The Taoist symbols are found in uh, Goryeo tomb murals uh, near Kangsu. And, okay, the, the Silla, having received Lao Tzu's uh, Tao Te Ching in 738, from the Tang, the Tang Emperor left the most substantial legacy of Taoism. Silla scholars went to China to study Taoism, and Lao Tzu was tested in civil service examinations. Yada yada. Go. These are the different periods, and I'm going to move on. So in uh, Tang Sudo, where you have to learn the meaning of the Korean flag. Now these symbols that are at each corner of the Korean flag, these are the different trigrams. Uh, trigrams are, um, they also have um, hexagrams or sexagrams, and what they are is the sexagrams or hexagrams are six bars, and these all have a different meaning. They mean they're the different elements, the different four elements. But let's see the symbolism here. So all three is heaven, okay? So, you'll see that heaven is to the right of the flag. Okay, the upper right of the flag. Earth is to the bottom left of the flag. Moon, which is uh, winter or ice, it would be like ice in the Nordic uh, sense. That is uh, to the upper left of the flag. And sun is to the bottom right of the flag. So let's talk in about what these are. So with heaven, the season is the spring, the cardinal direction is east, virtue is humanity, family is then family, it's the father, natural element, heaven, meaning is justice. Earth, season is summer, cardinal direction west, uh, virtue, courtesy, family, mother, earth, vitality. Uh, moon, the season is winter, direction is north, virtue is intelligence, family, it's the sun, natural element water see this is the uh the elements oh we were always taught it was the elements actually where it's heaven earth water and fire uh so it's water and wisdom okay so re the sun it's in autumn the south righteousness the daughter fire fruition okay so that's that so I wanted to start getting into some of the fundamental figures in Korean Tung Sudo, and it might surprise people that the probably the primary figure is actually the Okinawan Gichin Funakoshi. Now I'm not going to get into this in this video, this video has been long enough, but when I get into the second video, um, I'm going to talk about that uh, more so about Shotokan Karate, about all about Gichin Funakoshi, all about Okinawan Karate, and all about the role it played in the formation of Tung Sudo and the other modern Korean martial arts. And that's all for this video.